Greetings friends, my name is Lucas Mann and I pastor a church in South Carolina uh, in uh, Lauren, South Carolina, excuse me uh, and friends, I, I come out here this evening with some friends of mine for the purpose, to the end, to make known the gospel of grace here in downtown Greenville at this public meeting spot, this public latrine and friends, we are here out of a care for your soul, out of a care for where you are going to spend eternity. We care for your souls. And it is our great desire that you would repent and believe on Christ this evening, that you would flee to Christ for eternal life. It is our desire that by our preaching the gospel this evening, we would exalt our Savior, that we would exalt the Lord Jesus Christ who has died for us, who has shed His blood at Calvary's cross for our redemption. Friends, Jesus Christ is Lord. There is no other Lord but Christ. No other King but Christ. And there is no other way of salvation but through belief in the finished work of Christ for eternal life. Friends, we're here to warn you about the wrath of God which is to come, which will soon befall the wicked. Time is running out, friends. The days are counting down. The minutes are counting away. And every moment that passes by is a moment closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. To His return where He will judge the wicked. Where He will render judgment upon the enemies of God and receive His people into glory. Oh friends, it is our desire that you might be found in Christ not having a righteousness of your own derived from the law, but that you have the righteousness of Christ given to you as a gift of grace that on the day of judgment you might have joy. On the day in which Christ returns, you might have joy knowing that you are in Him and that your eternal salvation is sealed by His finished work. And even for Christians out here, we are out here for you as well, for your edification and your growth in grace. And ultimately, we are here for God we are here out of an act of worship unto God. Preaching the gospel is an act of worship. Sharing the gospel with the lost is an act of worship unto God the Most High, the Maker of heaven and earth. For there is no greater being but God. In fact, the Baptist Catechism, question one is, who is the first and best of beings? The answer, God is the first and best of beings, and therefore we appeal unto Him. And we do this unto Him and unto His glory. And for the glory of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. The, sc the Scripture that I would like to point your attention to this evening is in Romans chapter 2, in verses 17 through 21. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, writes these words. He says, But if you bear the name Jew, and rely upon the law, and boast in God, and know His will, and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth, you therefore, you who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? So, in short, the, script, the, the idea and the concept that Paul is laying forth here in these verses is the hypocrisy of the religious. Is re religious hypocrisy. And this text of Scripture has great application to the people of Greenville, South Carolina to the people who live in this very area. For we find ourselves in the midst of the Bible Belt, surrounded by churches on every corner, pastors all over the place. We hear preachers on television, preachers on the radio. They're all over the place. We have light. Friends, we have biblical truth all around us at our very disposal. And yet we are a wicked and perverse nation. We are a nation of idolaters, of murderers who slaughter their own children. For even in America, 4,000 babies die every day through the holocaust of abortion. Our friends, we are also a nation that is filled with, a, with adulterous people. 
people who are unfaithful, proud and self-righteous, addicted to drugs, addicted to drinking. How can this be? How can it be that we are the most Christian nation on earth, yet the most wicked nation on earth? How can that be? It is because there are many who say they know Christ, yet they know not the love of Christ. There are many who claim to be followers and disciples of Christ, but they do very little following of Christ. There are many who are in the midst of religious hypocrisy. In fact, you could say that their very lives are the epitome of hypocrisy. And oh friends, I say this not from simply the Scriptures, but even out of my own experience. For I myself was a hypocrite for many years. Eight years, to be exact, of my life was spent in hypocrisy, saying I myself knew, not, knew the love of Christ, knew the saving power of the cross, yet I lived as though He never gave me a law to obey. I lived as though the power of the cross was very little, and that it could only change a very small amount of the man. When, in fact, the Scriptures say that all of the man is changed in salvation. As Paul himself wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Salvation is a supernatural work of God upon the heart of man, whereby God gives the man a new nature, a new heart with new desires, new intentions, and new actions. In fact, the Bible describes it as the new birth, as regeneration, friends. And therefore, the question must be posed. The question must be posed to you, have you been born again? Have you been regenerated by the Spirit of God? The question is not, are you religious? The question is not, do you attend worship services on Sunday? The question is not, have you at one point in your life had a religious experience and therefore you were affirmed by religious leaders that you were converted? No, the question is, and the question stands, have you been born again? For the Lord Jesus Christ Himself said in John 3.3 3, that unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, he cannot ascertain spiritual things. Friends, have you been born again? See, I must point out your religious hypocrisy, for that is what Paul does here in, in this chapter of Romans. He is pointing out the error of the religious, showing them their desperate, dire need of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. And friends, ultimately, that's what I want us to consider this evening. Yes, the plight of the sinner. Yes, the plight of the religious hypocrite but also the saving grace of Jesus Christ that is revealed in the Gospel, the Gospel of the glory of God. Before I walk through this passage this evening, I would like to for a moment consider the context of this text in, its, in specifically where Paul is coming from and where he is going in Romans 2. And to put it shortly, Paul is calling out the hypocrisy of the religious. He began in chapter 1 by saying, that the book of Romans was an exposition of the gospel message. He said in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. But then before he lays before our eyes the glorious good news, he first must bring to our attention the bad news of man's plight and man's hopeless state before God. And so he begins by saying, just two verses later in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. It's bad news first, good news second. But Paul is pointing out the error of the pagan, the error of those who are not religious. But he moves the, the finger of accusation and points it upon the religious in chapter 2 of Romans. And then later on in chapter 3, he brings it all together and says both religious and not religious, both churched and unchurched, are lost and are in need of salvation. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, as he wrote in chapter 3, verse 23. And then later on, he explains the glorious gospel message. So we find this string of passages, these string of verses here, situated in chapter 2 of Romans, in the midst of Paul showing the religious their dire need of salvation. He actually said in verse 16, the verse previous, he says, 
concerning the day of judgment. In verse 16 he says, The day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. The judgment of God is coming upon the wicked. Friends, flee to Christ. Flee to Him for life eternal, for pardon, for eternal salvation through the precious blood of the Lamb of God. Flee! Flee to the Savior at once. He beckons and calls unto you through the preaching of the Gospel. The voice of God, as it were, is heard through the preaching of the Gospel. It is as if God is making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to Him. And so that brings us in verse 16 and carries right on into verse 17. As Paul continues discussing this issue of religious hypocrisy. So let us consider that. He says in verse 17, But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God... Now he begins here by laying before his audience some of the qualifications of the religious elite in Paul's day. And this, this bears very good weighty truth that we can apply to us today. For there are many people who say themselves to be Christians, who boast in God, who say they have the Holy Scriptures, who are perhaps born as, and born and raised Southern Baptist, and yet they are lost. He says in verse 18, and know His will and approve the things that are essential. Many people know the will of God. They know the Word of God. They approve the things that are essential. They say, yes, Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes, He is God. Yes, He has accomplished salvation. And yet they are still lost. It is not enough for you to affirm some biblical truth. No, you must be saved. You must be born again. You must be born from on high, friends. It is a gift from above. It is not enough to affirm some scriptural truths. For I myself as an unconverted lost man, I believed the Bible. I believed in six-day creation. I believed in the veracity of the scriptures. Yet I was lost. Verse 19, he says, And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. Do you say that you are a Christian and you say that you have the truth of the Gospel? Do you say that you yourself are converted and yet you do not live as though Christ gave you a law to obey? You do not live in submission and in obedience to His will? Then you're lost. It does not matter how much boasting that you produce. It does not matter how many times you claim to be a guide to the blind or a light to those who are in darkness. If you have not been born again, you are lost. He says in verse 20, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of truth. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? What Paul's saying is, okay, you have all this religious truth. You have all this at your disposal. And you teach others these things. But do you teach yourself these things? This reminds me so much of myself when I was a hypocrite and when I was lost. For I said I followed after Christ. I even knew the Gospel message. And I even told the Gospel to some people. I handed out Gospel tracts even. And yet I never preached to my own self. I never preached to my own soul. I never dealt with my own soul in light of the truths that I claimed I was proclaiming to others. And then verse... 21 says, You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? Do you who do you hear who say you are Christians? Do you obey the law that you say you obey? Do you obey the Lord Christ whom you say do you follow? Do you live in submission to the scriptures that you claim to believe? If you do not, it is because you're lost and you're a hypocrite and you need to be saved from your sins through the cleansing power of Jesus Christ's precious blood. It is in a great, an offense, an affront to God to be such a hypocrite. There is a special place in hell for hypocrites. A special place 
in that place of outer darkness for those who say they follow after Christ, yet do not live in obedience to Him. It is not that we are justified by our works, but our works evidence the fact that we have been justified. The works are not the cause of salvation, but they are surely the evidence of salvation. So if someone says, I know Him, I know Christ, but they live not for Christ, they do not know Him. They're lost. They're deceived and they're deluded. If someone truly knows Christ, they will live for Christ. Jesus warned of these such hypocrites in Matthew 7, verse, 20, verse 15. He says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. He says in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Verse 23, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Friends, examine yourselves. You who claim to be Christians, examine yourselves. See whether you truly obey Christ. Make your calling and election sure. Be sure that Christ is formed in you, lest you be eternally lost. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Look at your life. Actions speak louder than words, as the old saying goes, and it is true. Do you live for Christ as you say you do? If I, let's say for example, if I was married and I told my wife that I dearly loved her, but I went around committing adultery with many other women throughout town, I would be a liar. And how many people say they love Christ, but they live as though He never gave them a law to obey. They live as though they can commit spiritual adultery and not think twice about it. And they do it. Not only do they think it, but they do it. Such people are great to be pitied. If you claim to be a Christian and you live as a hypocrite, do me and all true Christians a favor by renouncing Christ. Stop being a Christian. Stop claiming to be a Christian and flee from your hypocrisy. I'd rather you say that you're not a Christian than you say that you are and act like a hypocrite. So if you say you know Christ, but you live like the majority of people who are in evangelical churches today, then, then don't say you're a Christian. Just stop it. You make it hard for me and true Christians to share the gospel, the true gospel. Instead, repent and believe on Christ for eternal salvation. This is exactly the issue Paul was dealing with in his day with the Jewish people. For they said that they had the true God, but they rejected Him who He sent. They rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal God-man. The eternal Son of God who became flesh, they rejected Him in their sin. And they proved themselves thereby to be hypocrites and to truly have not the Father. For as Scripture says, He who has a Son has the Father, and he who does not have the Son does not have the Father. But who is this triune God, we ask ourselves? Who is the God of Scripture? That is truly one of the greatest questions that our souls can ask. Who is the God of glory? Who is this triune God? He is holy. God is a holy God. He is set apart from all that is evil and all that is perverse and wicked. He Himself is absolutely perfect in His moral purity. God is a just judge as well, as we just read there in Romans 2 verse 16, where Paul says, on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Many people only like to think of God as some loving Father. And He is indeed. 
but that never negates his justice friends God is a just judge and he will judge the wicked with the uttermost vengeance and wrath Nahum 1 2 tells us that God is a, an avenging God Friends, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 4 that God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. He is jealous for justice to be administered upon the earth. And friends, in God's holiness and in His justice, God has put forth His law. It is true that God is merciful and gracious. And as the book of Exodus tells us, He is abounding in loving kindness. God bless you, sir. God bless you. But that never negates His holiness. In fact, His attributes stand in beautiful unison with one another. God certainly is not self-contradicting. Therefore, in His holiness, in His jealous desire for justice, God has given us His holy law, His Ten Commandments for us to obey. But there is great problem with this. Not that the law has issue, but that we have issue before the law. Because the law of God shows us two things, friends. Firstly, the character of God. And secondly, the character of man in light of the character of God. Firstly, it shows us the character of God. Consider the commands. God says you shall not lie. God says you shall not steal. God says that you shall not murder. God says you shall not commit adultery. Or God, say, God says you shall not blaspheme. Why does God give such commands? Because God is morally perfect. God is not a murderous God, therefore He forbids murdering. God does not steal. God owns all things. He has the prerogative to tell us what we ought to do with things. And therefore He says you shall not steal. God is not a liar. The book of Hebrews tells us God cannot lie. It is an impossibility. And therefore God in, con in beautiful unison with his character says you shall not lie or the command that says you shall not commit adultery why why does God do this because God is a perfect covenant keeping God and he hates it when spouses are unfaithful to one another so that is the first thing the law of God shows us it shows us the character of God Secondly, the law of God shows us the sinful plight of man. It shows us the great, horrible state that we are in before God. It shows us how filthy our sin is, that we are transgressors. For we look at the commands, we see that God says you shall not lie. And the Bible tells us all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. Oh, for, oh, God bless you, sir. Thank you. Friends, we have broken this command. Oh, God bless you, ma'am. You have a good evening. Another command, God says you shall not murder. And you may say, well, listen, I have never killed anybody unjustly. However, Jesus comes along in Matthew 5 and says, if you have anger in your heart toward your brother, that you are just as, mur just as guilty as a murderer. In fact, you deserve to be thrown in hell, Jesus said. If you have anger in your heart toward your brother un in an unjustified manner. Also the command, you shall not commit adultery. You say, I have never committed adultery. I've been faithful to my spouse. That may be true, but Jesus said in Matthew 5, any man who looks at a woman with lust commits adultery in the heart. Friends, God sees the mind. He sees the heart. He sees your wicked deeds. He sees even the intent of the heart that it is evil continually. As Genesis chapter 6 tells us in verse 5 of that same chapter, it says there, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Oh friends, the wickedness of man is great. The intent of his heart is perverse. He only loves sin and he hates the God who has given him life and who gives him every good thing that he enjoys in this world. Friends, friends, we must understand our sin before our God, the great triune God of glory.
And so therefore we find ourselves having broken the law of God, having transgressed His commands, and as Jesus said, we deserve to go to the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, the place called hell for the wicked. We deserve to go there because we have transgressed God's law. Just as a murderer here in South Carolina deserves to be punished for having murdered someone else, so too do we deserve to be punished before God because we've broken His law. Because we have broken His holy commands. We deserve hell. We deserve to be thrown into the place that is a place of an unquenchable fire. The place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place where God punishes the wicked. Where He destroys the body and the soul in His wrath and in His justice. And so therefore we are truly without hope in and of ourselves. Having brought upon ourselves eternal condemnation. However, however, friends, in the mercy of God and in the grace of God, God sent forth His Son, Jesus Christ. In His love for His people, Jesus came to fulfill the law. As Jesus Himself said in Matthew 5, 17, He said, do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He came to live in perfect submission to all the commands of God that God gave. And He fulfilled it. The Father declared over Christ in Matthew 3.17, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Christ fully kept the law of God that we broke. And then, in His glorious Love In His great love, He laid down Himself as the Lamb of God. And He was beat and betrayed into the hands of sinners. He was spat upon and nailed to the cross of Calvary. Nailed there to suffer for His people. He hung there for those hours upon that cross, bearing upon His own shoulders the weight of the wrath of God the Almighty. And in those few hours, the wrath of the Father was spent on His Son. Isaiah 53 10 says it pleased the Lord to crush him it pleased the, the father's wrath it it satisfied the father's wrath to crush his son this is justice friends this shows us the holiness and the love of God the righteousness and the grace of God the cross of Christ is glorious it is the power of God unto salvation 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Truly the cross of Jesus Christ is that. It is the life-changing power of God. Mark 15.38 reads, it says, and this is right when Jesus died. It says, And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The, the barrier that stood before us in God has been removed. We now have access to the Father through the death of His Son. After three days in the tomb, Christ was raised from the grave. Christ was risen. He has been raised to newness of life. He will never die again. Death no longer shall have any power over Him. He has defeated it. In fact, in Mark 16, verse 6, the angel who appeared there at the empty tomb said to the women who were there, he said, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus and Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is a place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Oh, friends. Oh, dear friends. Jesus has completed the work of salvation once for all. After 40 days of further ministry among his disciples, after being raised from the grave, he then bodily ascended into heaven and He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high and He's completed the work of eternal salvation once for all. It is done. He sits there now on His throne in glory 
reigning as King, reigning as Lord, and He lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. The proper heart reaction to the Gospel is one of repentance and faith. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, The time is fulfilled. The Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the Gospel. Friends, you must repent. You must be broken over your sin. You must be done with yourself. You must loathe yourself and see that you cannot free yourself from your sin and embrace Christ. You cannot clean yourself up, friends. You must be convinced of your bankruptcy, your spiritual bankruptcy, and flee to the rich Savior who brings riches, spiritual riches to the most poor wretch. Friends, I am a vile, wretched sinner. I am a beggar telling other beggars where to find the bread of life, where to find the manna from heaven, Jesus Christ, the eternal God-man, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten, Son of the Most High God. And friends, you must believe. You must believe the Gospel. Repent and believe. And the sinner that does such a thing, which is only accomplished by the power of the Spirit of God, that person will be pardoned of all their sin. They will be forgiven because of Christ's atoning work of the cross. Forgiven of all their sin, all their rebellion, past, present, future. It will be gone because of what Jesus did at the cross. And they will be credited with having lived Jesus' life. They will be credited with the righteousness of Christ, wrapped in His perfect righteousness. The Father will look upon them as if they lived Christ's life because He looked at Christ as if He lived theirs. That's the exchange of the Gospel, friends, that Jesus takes my sin and I receive His perfect righteousness as a gift of grace. Friends, salvation is out of the free mercy of God. It is by grace we have been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, friends. It is the free mercy of God offered to vile wretches, vile sinners. And friends, for the person who is genuinely converted, they will bear great fruit of conversion. They will bear fruit of this. Their life will be changed because they've been given a new nature. Because they've been born from above. Because God has given them new birth. Because God has done a work. The work that God begins in the hearts of sinners, He will bring to completion. And so they will think differently. They will act differently. Their heart's desires will be different. They will love the Word of God. They will love prayer. They will love the saints of God. They will love to worship God. That is the evidence of conversion. The one who says to him, I, the one who says concerning him, I know him, and yet does not keep his commandments is a liar. The evidence of conversion is work, not the cause. The cause of salvation is God's sovereign will, not the will of man. No man can will himself into the kingdom of God. Free will brought many a soul to hell, but never a soul to heaven. For the will of man is bound only to do sin continually. That's why in Romans 9.16 Paul says, So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. And friends, this Gospel is not only for the unconverted soul. No! This is for the church of Jesus Christ. This is for believers. This is for the saints of God. This Gospel is not just for the pagan and for the religious hypocrite, but for the genuinely religious person. For the genuine child of God. Because this is our daily bread. This is what we feed upon daily. This is the manna from heaven. And so, even for the Christian, it ought to be upon his heart and mind every day, this Gospel message. This message of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on behalf of His people ought to be their meditation both day and night. It ought to be what they preach to the lost to the day they die. All by grace. All by the free grace of God to the glory of God, to the praise of God, to God's glory and honor and exaltation. God has so ordered salvation to be all of His free grace so that He gets all the glory.
And so the exhortation stands, flee to Christ for the glory of God. Do all that you do for the glory of God. Friends, give God the glory indeed. Give God the glory indeed in all things. Come to Him through His Son. Give Him glory by doing so. Mm. To God be the glory in your life and in mine and in all things as He works all things according to the counsel of His most holy will. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 11. He says in verse 36 simply, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen and amen. You who are lost, flee. Flee to Christ. Turn from your sin. Turn from your selfishness. And turn to Christ. You who are religious hypocrites and you who have seen your sin or you who claim to be followers of Christ, examine yourself. See whether you're in the faith. And if you're lost, flee to Christ and have true salvation. And if you are already saved in Christ, then preach the gospel. This is for the Christian. This exhortation is for the Christians. Christians, preach the gospel to the lost. Share the gospel with the lost and dying world by the grace of Almighty God. Because time is running out and soon the wicked will be damned. We must preach the gospel to them so that they are saved. So we have seen here in conclusion in Romans chapter 2 in verses 17 to 21 the hypocrisy of the religious and specifically in Paul's day the hypocrisy of the Jews but in our day the hypocrisy of the Southern Baptists or the hypocrisy of the churchmen here in the biblical South. We have seen that we have all sinned, yes. That we are sinners in the hands of an angry God by default. But God has made provision. God has made a way, the way of salvation through His Son. Through the death, burial, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so friends, I exhort you to flee. To believe upon Christ for eternal life. And we have seen that this is not only for the lost, but for saints. And it is all by grace, so that it is all to the glory of God. All things are working to that glorious end. Why has God made this world? Why has God made you and me? For His glory. For His ultimate praise and honor. As the Baptist Catechism says in question two, what is man's chief end? Or excuse me, what is the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And so may God be glorified in the preaching of the gospel of His Son, in my life and in yours, in this world and in all things. God bless you, sir. As He works all things, to the end that He Himself might be glorified. To the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One in being and essence in nature, yet three distinct persons. To this holy, thrice holy God, the God of glory, be all glory and honor and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen.